The term window dressing is one with which we are all more than familiar. The definition of a window dressing is a superficial display that is more or less designed to give something a misleading but favorable appearance. As I went past this most recent MLK Day, I found myself thinking more and more about the man himself and then doing my due diligence to truly understand more about the man, the myth, the legend. Because as we all know, this is a time of the year where individuals sometimes will have the day off work and there's extra free time. And I would argue what's most important is using that free time effectively. Now, what I chose to spend most of yesterday doing yesterday evening was educating myself further on the man himself and where he really came from, what his true ideologies really were. I made a post on Instagram and I said, good morning. Martin Luther King Jr. was a secret Marxist. Uh, Marxism is cancer. Have a great day. A lot of individuals took umbrage with that statement. But the body of proof I'm going to present with this video this evening will hopefully help you open your eyes to information that far too many people are not made privy to. In order to do that, we have to turn back the clock 95 years to the year 1928. In the year 1928, there was a communist revolutionary by the name of Joseph Pagani. Joseph Pagani wrote a book entitled The American Negro Problem. And he wrote this book under a fake name. The fake name was John Pepper. In this book, almost 100 years ago, Joseph Pagani accurately identified the fact that the Negro Revolution could be ripe for radicalization or communist infiltration. Again, this is almost 100 years ago. But as we fast forward more and more to the present day, we begin to see a playbook that emerges. Now, if you're familiar with communists and socialists and Marxists, as it were, you'll know that Marxism is an ideology that is rooted in the struggles between different social classes of people. Communism is simply the governmental vehicle that operates using the tenets of Marxist ideology. Knowing that and using that as the foundation will help us to further understand and unpack where we are today in 2023 and where we were even back during the days of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, if you are familiar with the communist ideology or the, their methods for taking over a country, they have five particular phases. Now, the first phase, and this is all described by Lenin, who many would argue was the architect of the communist agenda. And those five phases were as follows. It was to divide the people. It was to create a sense of public support. And then it was to mobilize more or less the rioters, if you will. And then it was also to argue and try to get some sort of legislative fixes to the perceived injustices of the day. The one that I left out was to neutralize the opposition. I'm looking at my notes because I want to make sure I'm very specific with this. Now, these are all very specific phases that communists have used time and time again in order to bring countries to their knees in order to advance the causes of communism, which again operates under the tenets of Marxist ideology. So as I began to understand the link between communism and the present day, I began to turn and look at the man Martin Luther King Jr. himself. If you are familiar with Martin Luther King Jr.'s civil rights organization, the SCLC, that is on record as having noted incredible amounts of communist uh, intervention or influence. If you look that up, you can find the information for yourself. But it stands to mention that Dr. King himself was a Baptist minister, even though if you go back and look at what much of what Martin Luther King Jr. espoused in old texts and old speeches back in the day, you could argue whether or not he truly did believe in all of the core tenets of Christianity. But as I began to think again about MLK, after MLK Day came and went, I began to ask myself another particular question. That question was, why is it that he is still remembered and vaunted and pushed to the fore as an example of everything that is all well, true and good with the world by the same party, the same faction on the left side of the aisle that goes out of their way to obfuscate or shroud the accomplishments of other notable civil rights activists or thinkers of our day. 
Thomas Sowell comes to mind. Ben Carson comes to mind. Larry Elder comes to mind. Why is it that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is still lifted up while all references or any sort of praise for Thomas Sowell or Ben Carson is effectively muted? When you begin to understand how effective the communist playbook truly is, then you begin to understand and connect the dots between what Martin Luther King Jr. espoused publicly and privately, you know, we saw take place in 19, in the 1960s and now here in the present day. Some of the tenets around Marxism and communism, they rely on the creation of a perceived slight, no matter how real that slight might actually be. But whenever there is a rift, there was actually a communist article or directive that came out in 1943 that actually indicated the methodology in which to make sure this plan act actually works. And in that, they said, what you need to do is make sure that anyone who opposes the stated revolutionaries is to be ridiculed and demeaned as a fascist, as a Nazi, as an anti-Semite. This is information you can look up for yourself. But what the communists knew and what they actually further wrote was that if you simply repeat these attacks long enough, then they will become facts in the public mind. If you repeat these slurs, these insults, eventually you can condition a people to view the other side, the metaphorical other side, as the enemy. Because again, communists, they want that class warfare because class warfare is a tenet of Marxism. But once you've divided the people, right, then you're able to move to the next phase. That next phase is creating the appearance of popular support. We saw that take place in the 1960s during the civil rights era, before the Civil Rights Act was actually even passed. We saw that with the tragic and unfortunate bombing of the Birmingham church in which four young girls lost their lives. This created that aura that was needed for individuals to move to the next phase, part three of the communist takeover agenda. That phase is neutralizing the opposition. Because think about it this way, there is something to be said for the art of creating an illusion. And communists and individuals who are against America and freedom and capitalism will do everything in their power to be as subversive but covert as possible. Once you've advanced to this phase, what you are hoping for is that those on one side will begin to see the other side as the enemy. And then when they do that, you can then weaponize those two factions against each other. In the civil rights era, that was more or less the white versus black duopoly or dichotomy, if you will. And as you saw the rise of the NAACP, which was founded by white liberals of the day who used black faces as the shield for that organization, that was able to further deepen that rift. And then again, it goes to the demonstration phase, right? Phase four, precipitating mob violence. Now you might say Martin Luther King Jr. was a noted pacifist and he was arguing for nonviolence and this is very much the case. But you begin to continue to connect those dots and you'll see why I said what I said in my Instagram post. Mob violence more or less is the lighting of an emotional powder keg by a group of people who share some sort of shared grievance. And if the communist ideology is done effectively, individuals will begin to see the world around them as in all the chaos around them, as if it is, this is justified because we are fighting for freedom or democracy as the term may be. And this is something that is parroted over and over again. But I mentioned earlier, there's a template. We've seen time and time again in countries like Algeria, countries like Venezuela, countries like Cuba, where these exact same tactics were utilized to precision. And what I also find very revealing is you go back to the civil rights era where Martin Luther King Jr. was marching hand in hand with many of the civil rights activists of the day. But you rewind the clock back to some of these other countries when they were going through times of unrest and you see them marching with linked arms and you see individuals, especially in places like Venezuela, their rallying cry was vinceremos, vinceremos, I should say. And what that translates to is we shall overcome. 
which is the same song that many civil rights activists would sing as they were marching through the streets, arguing for, arguably, freedom in that case. But when you begin to understand that everything about this has been planned for a long time, you start to ask the question, who was it or what organization, what entity, what group decided that Martin Luther King Jr. was going to become the face of the movement for all intents and purposes? Who is it that decides one person is going to be the spokesperson over another? I mentioned earlier that the SCLC, Martin Luther King Jr.'s a civil rights organization, was impacted heavily by communist input. What I also mentioned, what did, I did not mention, but I should mention now, is that there were many times throughout MLK's uh, time in life where he vociferously denounced any linkage between the civil rights movement and communism. And he said, there's as many communists in our movement, in our freedom movement, as there are Eskimos in Florida. But why would he say that and then be photographed shaking hands with Algerian President um, Ben Bala, uh, Ahmed Ben Bala is his name, who was the leader of the Algerian revolution? Look this picture up for yourself. It is there. Why is it that Martin Luther King Jr. went on record multiple times denouncing capitalism? and calling for various socialist tenets that do very closely mirror Marxist ideology and scope. Why is it that in 1965, one year after the Civil Rights Act was introduced and passed, why is it that seven days after the Watts riots or Watts rebellion in Los Angeles, why was a communist party newspaper founded that ran from 1965 to 69 in Los Angeles called The People's Voice. And why was their first article written seven days after the Watts Rebellion began? And why were they giving praise to the Chinese, to the Chinese people in the Communist Party and praising the United States for pledging their allegiance to these individuals who were rioting in the streets? Remember those phases I talked about? We are now on phase four of the communist agenda. And then the fifth phase, is introducing legislation or creating the appearance of revolution. That inevitably is going to lead to the clashes between one side or the other. And as you look at the timeline of Martin Luther King Jr. and look at the timeline from today, what you realize is that these two times more or less mirror each other very, very closely. But when you also look back at Martin Luther King, what I found most revealing and most shocking was a statement that he made in Selma in 1965. I'm gonna read the statement to you because it is so revealing and so evident of what I'm trying to bring home. Think about this. In 1965 in Selma, Martin Luther King Jr. explained the purposes of the marches and demonstrations he was leading as follows. He said, first, nonviolent demonstrators go into the streets. Second, the racists would resist. Third, Americans in the name of decency would demand federal legislation. Fourth, the administration would create immediate intervention and remedial legislation. What he just said in 1965 is line by line exactly what communists would push for when doing their best to overthrow a country. That's something that most people don't adequately realize because he has been given the window dressing treatment. Because it has been a supercilious front that has been portrayed for far too long in order to allow individuals to forget some of the very unfortunate past remarks that a leader like Martin Luther King Jr. actually had. But I'll also say this, those who would wish for the overthrow of America those who adhere to the Marxist Leninist tenets are also very aware that Lenin said that if communism was done effectively and introduced effectively to America, that America would fall without the need for an attack, that we would fall like overripe fruit into the hands of the communists. Knowing that he said that then, and then looking at the template and playbook that they used with Martin Luther King Jr., it begs the question, how involved was he with this Marxist, socialist, communist takeover? 
And if you do enough research after this video is over, you'll come to the same conclusion that I did, which is unfortunately that Martin Luther King Jr. was inextricably intertwined with Marxists, with communists, and that the civil rights playbook of the 60s is simply being pulled out again and utilized with more ferocity in 2023. It's an unsettling notion. It's unsettling to learn new information, but it is vitally important that we do more than simply accept the history that we are given because we know that history is defined and determined by the individuals who write it. And if they are able to effectively whitewash, if you want to use that term or diminish or mute the true information, you have to take it upon yourself to be initiated enough to find that information for yourself. Because I'll tell you, they're not done with America yet. And what they're simply doing is utilizing the same tactics they did before. Think about this. We know that Martin Luther King Jr. was a noted black Baptist pastor, right? Those communists, even going as far back as Joseph Pagani, when he wrote that book, uh, The American Negro uh, Problem, back in 1928, they realized that the African-American population is a very religiously based people. In the present day, that is still very much the case. They knew in the 1960s that an individual who could garner the most support and the most groundswell of public enthusiasm would be a black pastor because black ministers, especially in the South, were revered back in the day for the positions they held. And those in power, those who wish to overthrow America, they knew that if they could just co-opt and utilize someone to their own ends and make someone else the cannon fodder or the poster boy for what their true nefarious agenda really was, that the average American, especially the average black American, would not realize and catch on until it was too late to reverse course. They've done it before with Martin Luther King Jr. Why do you think Reverend Raphael Warnock in Georgia gets so much support? It's the exact same playbook being used again. That is why I want you to think long and hard about the information that you've been given and also challenge yourself to do more research than you did in the past. I've done lots of work to compile this information from all corners of the web and bring it to you, but there are resources out there and I highly encourage you, if you want to know more information, you need to watch the movie Anarchy USA released in 1966 by G. Edward Griffin. Watch that movie and then watch the Uncle Tom movies, Uncle Tom 1 and Uncle Tom 2. I am in Uncle Tom 1. I will be in Uncle Tom 3. But that's where you can find more of this information. But you have to take it upon yourself to take the time to do more research. Because if you don't, you can become like those individuals on the left who are asleep. Individuals even on the right I've seen over the past 24, 48 hours making posts lauding Martin Luther King Jr. Not to say that he didn't do anything good, but even if you were to believe, and you take this with a grain of salt, what the FBI file said about Martin Luther King and many other people have said, he had some other problems that most people aren't aware of, being a philanderer and so on and so forth. That's another topic for another day. But just know that the information is out there, but you're going to have to find yourself. It's going to take time. And I'll, I'll leave you with this. One of the quotes that I love is that the truth will set you free, but first it'll tick you off. And if you allow yourself to remain ticked off, you become a tool for the enemy. If you take the next step beyond being ticked off to truly understand the information, that is when the awakening truly begins. And that's the message for this video. Let's pray. God, you tell us in John chapter eight, verse 32, you say, uh, the truth will set us free. And I ask you to give individuals out there watching the hunger to find the truth, to uncover the truth, to question what they are told, what they've been led to believe so that they can find the peace that only does truly come with that knowledge. I ask you to give them the measures of resolve needed to find the answers to difficult questions and then to also question what they have been told by the powers that be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's the message for this video. This, treat this video as breadcrumbs. 
If I could sat, sat here and talked about all of everything I knew, it would take an hour. But take the information I gave you and begin to launch yourself down that fact-finding journey for yourself. You're going to uncover other names along the way, not just Martin Luther King Jr. You're going to uncover names like uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, like Jesse Jackson. You're going to uncover W.E.B. Du Bois. Go back to Booker T. Washington. Go back. You're going to find a lot of information, and it might feel overwhelming. But the good news is, with knowledge does come power. And I want you to feel that power that I feel when I open the camera, when I press go live, and deliver the information you've come to expect from me. But you know how it is. It's Damani Felder. Find me on Facebook. Find me on Instagram. Find me on TikTok. Find me on Twitter. Find me on Rumble. Find me on Telegram. Find me on Parler. Find me on Getter. Find me on True Social. The list goes on and on. I will continue to create the quality content, the thought-provoking content that you've come to expect from me. And all I ask is if this video made you think, if you enjoyed it, please press that like button on this page. Please follow the page. Please subscribe. Whatever action it takes, completely free but it helps me amplify my voice and reach more and more people with the truth. But thank you so, for, so much for watching. I love you all. I appreciate you all. And I'll catch you in the next one.